Hello, my name is Dr. Roderick L. Roll, and today I will be talking to you about microscopy. In this image, we have a compound light microscope. This is very similar to the one that you will use in lab. Please be familiar with all of the necessary parts of this microscope. Four general rule principles of microscopy exist and we will go through each one of these. The first one is the wavelength of radiation. The second one is magnification. The third is resolution. And finally, we will talk about contrast. The first one looks at radiation. In order to better explain radiation, let's look at the electromagnetic spectrum. So the sum of all types of electromagnetic radiation is contained within this electromagnetic spectrum, which starts from the uh, shortest wavelength of radiation, which is the gamma ray, to the far left of this image, going all the way to the radio waves, which has the longest distance between crest or waves or troughs. What we will uh, emphasize in this lecture is just the visible light portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. This is Roy G. Biv. Uh, as you can see in the image where it says visible light, this is the portion that we're going to use to see specimens using the compound light microscope. Compound light microscope uses visible light. That will be the first category of microscopes that we will discuss. Light will refract through the specimen followed by two convex lenses that will flip the image. It will then rotate the image and it will also enlarge the image. So in this image that we're looking at, you see the radiation, visible light, and it is going through one medium. This medium is called air. And then when it reaches the glass lens that is convexed, it will be refracted. It will bend. This bending is going to create the image. The total magnification of the, of the microscope can be calculated by multiplying the ocular lens, that is the one that's closest to your eye, and the objective lens, the one that is closest to the specimen. In this picture, I've labeled the ocular lens as 10x. Most ocular lenses that you will encounter, you on these microscopes will be 10x, but you should always look at the ocular lens to make sure it should be labeled. And then the objective lens, most of the microscopes you will use would have four different objective lenses. Make sure you read the number that's on that lens also. But when you combine those two values, you will get the total magnification. This is how uh, this is how uh, magnified the image is compared to your eye. The ability to separate objects that are close together is referred to as resolution. In this image, we have two dots that are very close together. They're labeled image one. And then image two, th those dots are further apart. If you were at the back of the classroom, 
about 30 feet away from the projector screen, it will be hard for you to distinguish that image one is two dots versus if you're close to the projector screen, you would be able to distinguish that these two circles are separated by a great distance. So what the microscope does is it helps to resolve these two dots as being separate dots. This next slide is labeled uh, limits of resolution. In this slide, we have different organisms um, such as a flea. Most of y'all have who own pets. You've seen a flea before, but it's very small. And you can see that with a naked eye versus Euglena, a very large Euglena, you might not be able to see that with the naked eye. So you would need a microscope to do that. So the compound microscope helps to resolve dots that are 200 nanometers in um, separation of the two dots. So as these dots get closer together, your eye will not be able to discern that they are separate dots resolution. Then you would need a microscope to discern that they are separate dots. Therefore, the uh, image with the red blood cells. With your naked eye, you would just see it as red. Whereas with a compound microscope, you would be able to see the individual circular erythrocytes. Uh, the chloroplast, you would need a microscope, compound microscope, to be able to discern the individual chloroplast. Mitochondria, you would also need the compound microscope. And even with bacteria. So bacteria, you cannot see with the naked eye. You need a compound microscope at least. So if you look at uh, in this picture, it says unaided. So unaided, you cannot resolve images such as bacteria or mitochondria. You can only resolve a pig, a chicken egg, and a flea. Reflective index is the bending of light as it moves through an object or medium. In this image, the light is moving through air, then it moves through glass. And when it reaches the glass, it is refracted. It is bent. And then when it comes out of the glass, it is bent again as it goes through the air. So that is refractive index, the bending of light as it moves through these different different objects. The specimen that the light will go through must be very thin. So if you recall in your general biology class, we took an onion and we sliced the onion and you put slices on a slide and you viewed it under the microscope. If the onion slice was too thick, you could not see anything. The reason being the light could not go through the image. It has to be refracted. It has to bend as it goes through this image. So if the image is, I mean, if the specimen is too thick, the light will not penetrate. And the light is the thing that is making you be able to see the image. So the greater the difference in refractive indexes, the sharper the contrast when viewed under the microscope. The light rays can pass through one medium, such as air, and then it can pass through another medium, which is the water that might be part of the wet mount that you created. So one example is substance one will be the water or glass. 
and the substance two would be the bacteria so light is going to refract as it goes through these different mediums the first one being the glass the second one being the bacterial cell the final one we'll discuss is contrast contrast is the difference in color that makes an ob object distinguishable so to explain this we use the apples because one apple is red with a sea of green apples you're able to distinguish that one apple so that is contrast the difference in color that makes the object distinguishable makes it viewable so how we're going to increase contrast we're going to use stains when we stain the bacteria too much light can reduce the color can reduce the contrast and it can burn out the image so please use the adjustable iris diaphragm to control the amount of light that enters the condenser so this is why on day one you're supposed to look at the microscope get familiar with the microscope and then practice with the microscope as I informed you in biology one when we purchase these slides they cost five dollars a piece and when you turn on the light source you're burning out the image why because these slides have been stained to increase contrast so if you cannot see uh, the different uh, objects within the specimen it's because the stain is bad because the stain has been degraded because of the light so what you do is you always reduce the amount of light that's coming through the specimen so the condenser lens directs the light through the specimen always turn this down then look through the ocular lenses to view your specimen and then turn it up until you see a sharp image staining increases contrast for those cells that lack it some cells have color already in it some cells do not if the cell does not have color then we can artificially stimulate by adding color adding dyes and we will talk about these different cationic and anionic dyes later the use of light that is in phase will also increase contrast the waves crest and troughs are aligned so in this image to the right I have two images the one that is uh, has a yellow square around it this is saying that the, the waves are in phase so if you think of an ocean wave you have the the highest part will be the crest and the low part will be the trough so if you look at the crest of all four of these lines in this image they're all in alignment whereas if you look at the image that is not surrounded by the yellow square those rays or those crests are not in sync so by you can increase contrast by synchronizing these waves so the source of light we're going to talk about three categories of microscopes the first one is visible light the second one is ultraviolet light and the third one is electron beam the first one we'll look at is all of the different microscopes that fall under the category of visible light and remember visible light is the Roy G Biv of the electromagnetic spectrum 
So microscopes that use visible light as the source of illumination include dark field microscopes, bright field microscopes, and phase microscopes. And we will discuss each one. The first one that we will discuss is bright field microscopes. Under the bright field category, we have the simple microscope and the compound microscope. We will use extensively the compound microscope in this class. The simple microscope contains a single magnifying lens. This is an example of the type of microscope that Leeuwenhoek used. Leeuwenhoek used this simple microscope to observe his animalcules or his very small microorganisms. This only uses one lens. It's sort of like using a magnifying glass. The second type of microscope that we'll discuss is the compound microscope. It uses a series of lenses to increase the magnification. So the light rays are going to pass through a specimen and into objective lenses, then into an ocular lens. In the image below, we're just looking at the objective lenses. Notice that we have four different types of object objective lenses. We have uh, the, the scanning, which is the 4X. We have the low power, which is the 10X. We have the high power objective, which is the 40X. And we have the oil immersion, which is 100X. Notice the distance from the lens to the actual slide, the working distance, they call it. So the working distance will decrease as magnification increases. Here is two images of compound microscopes. The first one is a monocular. It has only one eyepiece, whereas the other one is a biocular. It has two lenses. We're going to skip numerical aperture, but what it is is the lens ability to capture light coming from a specimen. This just helps you understand those other numbers that you might see on the objective lens. They are numerical aperture values. The oil immersion lens uses oil. So oil used on this lens will increase resolution. Light travels at the same speed through the oil. So it helps to increase the sharpness and the contrast of the image. If you look at the image to the left versus the one to the right, notice that fewer rays are being captured by the objective lens. So the one without oil, I'm going to count one, two, three lens, I mean three rays are obtained. Whereas the one to the right, you have one, two, three, four, five rays that are captured. Therefore, the oil helps to increase the resolution and contrast and sharpness. One type of compound is the bright field microscope. So the bright field microscope is the simplest optical microscopy that we have. Illumination, light, is transmitted through the sample and the contrast is generated by absorption of light in dense areas of the specimen. In this picture, we have an image of a bright field image. In this picture, the microscopist is looking through the eyepiece and let's follow just the dark field path and the, I mean the, the bright field path. So in the bright field, 
the specimen is going to appear against a bright background. Whereas dark field is a little bit different. We're going to use a central circular disk stop that is going to prevent direct condensing rays from entering the objective lens. Only a few rays that are scattered by the object will enter into the objective lens. With this, the microscopist will have an image, but it will appear bright against a dark background. So the dark field microscope is best for observing pale objects. The dark field increases contrast and enables observations of more detail. The specimen appears light against the dark background. This image shows the dark field stop. Notice how it is going to obstruct the light so that only fragment of the light is going to be able to penetrate the specimen. And then those few that are refracted as they come through the specimen will be captured. Here is an actual picture of a dark field condenser that you will put right above that um, light source on this microscope. This is a video to watch someone use the dark field microscope. We will watch this in class. The third type of microscope is the phase microscope and it is used to examine living organisms or specimens that would be damaged or altered by attaching them to slides or staining them. So most of the items that we'll look at in class, we are going to heat the specimen so that the specimen becomes sticky. We're going to stick the specimen to a slide. This is going to alter the shape of the specimen and it's going to help kill the specimen. Then we stain the specimen and we look at the organism. Sometimes, depending on what kind of class you're in, you might want to see a specimen that has not been heated and altered and stained. In that case, you would use the phase microscope. So you use a phase microscope to look at living organisms. This type of microscope treats one set of light rays differently from another set of light rays. I put a, a red box around the different light rays. One light ray is retarded, whereas the other light ray is unretarded. So look at the first one. Um, starting at our light source and we'll go through our first condenser. Then the light goes through our specimen. Then as the light leaves the specimen, notice that some of the light rays are slowed. So light rays have a certain speed. But if we retarded the light rays, the ones with the dotted lines are slowed then they're going to go through the objective lens. And then now they come to the phase plate. And then it goes to the image. So two of those rays are dotted and two of those rays are not dotted. The ones that are not dotted are not retarded. And the ones that are dotted are retarded. So these wave lengths are out of phase. They are, one of them is faster than the other. This is going to create a better image. So light rays 
in phase produce a brighter image while light rays out of phase produce a darker image. So if you look at the picture on the bottom, starting at our light source, the light goes through the lens. And when it gets to the portion that I wrote in phase, they are in phase. Then once it goes through the phase plate, notice how it becomes out of phase. Then it goes through the bacteria. So this is just another type of microscope that can be used to see organisms. Remember, you would use this one if you don't want to damage the specimen. When we look at the bacteria under, under the microscope and we use stains, we have altered the shape of those bacteria. If you want to look at the bacteria in its natural state, you would use this phase contrast microscope. So two phase types exist, phase contrast microscope and this differential interference contrast microscope. The first one is phase contrast and it converts the phase shifts of light passing through a transparent specimen. This allows detectable brightness changes in the image. This microscope will cost you about 5,000 bucks. Here is an image of the phase contrast, micro, uh, phase contrast image. Notice that there is not really a great difference between uh, some of the other types of images that we observed. So you would only use this microscope if you did not want to damage the cell but if you don't mind damaging the cell if you have an endless supply of cells then you can use one of the other ones and the other ones are a cheaper price so remember a regular compound microscope costs between 800 bucks and 1000 bucks whereas this phase contrast is about five grand the next type of microscope is differential interference contrast or DIC. It separates a polarized light source into two separate beams which are spatially displaced at the sample plane and then recombine before the final image formation. This is just another way of preserving the specimen that you're trying to observe. Here is an image of what this microscope would look like. Here is a bacteria observed under this DIC microscope. Here is an example of both the phase contrast versus the DIC. So that concludes our light microscope, the ones that use visible light. Now we'll look at several microscopes that use ultraviolet light or ultraviolet radiation. So it's going to use UV as a source of illumination. And there's two types that we'll look at, fluorescent microscopes and confocal microscopes. Here's our concept map. So we've, we're done with the visible light. Now we're at the ultraviolet light. The first one is fluorescent microscopes. Fluorescent microscopes direct UV light at the specimen. This causes the specimen to radiate energy back as a longer visible wavelength. The radiating back of energy is called fluorescence. So in our picture, you see that we're exciting it with one form of radiation and it gives off a different form called fluorescence, which is the emission, the green graph portion. 
some cells such as uh, Pseudomonas arginosa and molecules are naturally fluorescent while others must be stained with fluorescent dyes and in this picture to the right are different examples of fluorescent dyes rocks tamra hex vic joe these are different fluorescent dyes that we use in science to visualize different structures in specimens one example that you looked at in your general biology class was when you got to the chapter on mitosis you observed these images well this image was created by using fluorescent dyes where they gave radiated energy to the dye and the dye radiated back a different type of energy called fluorescence and then you were able to pick up the different fluorescent colors so in this image they use one type of stain one type of fluorescence to look at the spindle fiber they use a different type of fluorescence to look at the actual chromosomes So dyes are used in immunofluorescence to identify pathogens and to locate and make visible a variety of proteins. So we can use this to look at something as simple as mitosis and we can use this to look at a cross section of tissue to see if the tissue has a worm, to see if the tissue has a bacteria in it and more importantly what portion of the tissue contains it you can use this fluorescent type microscope to do that the second type that we will look at is confocal microscopes confocal microscopes also use fluorescent dyes it use it utilizes uv lasers to illuminate fluorescent chemicals in a single plane that is no thicker than one micrometer the resolution is increased by up to 40 percent because emitted light passes through a pinhole aperture then a computer will construct a three-dimensional image from the digitized images so now we're going to now use the fluorescent dyes but we're now going to incorporate a computer to help create a three-dimensional image this is going to increase cost here is a confocal microscope notice how it is attached to the computer and this microscope runs about two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars and you must purchase a ten thousand dollar service contract that is a lot of bands the last and final group of microscopes we'll discuss is the ones that use electron beam light microscopes cannot resolve structures closer than 200 nanometers because the shortest wavelength of visible light is only 400 nanometers look at the picture and look at my Roy G Biv this violet has a wavelength of 400 nanometers so by utilizing visible light you cannot resolve anything lower than that so you cannot resolve objects that are closer than 200 nanometers apart the UV microscopes cannot resolve structures closer than 200 nanometers either but the electron microscope can electrons have wavelengths of 
0.01 nanometer to 0.001 nanometer. So electron microscopes have greater resolving power and greater magnification. This microscope is able to magnify objects 10,000 times the magnification of your eye and up to 100,000 times the magnification of your eye. Very powerful. Electron microscope provides a detailed view of bacteria, viruses, internal cellular structures, molecules, and large atoms. It has a resolving power of 0.5 nanometers. There's two types of electron microscopes we will discuss. The first one is transmission electron micrograph, a microscope, and the other is scanning electron microscope. The first one, the transmission electron microscope, is used to view detailed structures of cells. This microscope has to splice and take microscopic thin slices of the specimen in order for it to work. So in this image, we're looking at a, a rod-shaped bacteria that was thinly sliced. And then to the left of that rod, you see a thinly sliced coccus, circular bacteria. The transmission electron microscope is very expensive. It costs roughly $100,000. The next microscope is the scanning electron microscope. It creates an extremely detailed three-dimensional image by bombarding the surface of the specimen with metal and then it scans back and forth to create this beautiful image. Here is some more images of a scanning electron microscope. This is Aspergillus, which is a fungus. You've, you remember paramecium from general biology and some bacteria that we will be looking at in this class. The scanning electron microscope is very expensive. It costs roughly $1 million for this microscope. The last type of microscope we will skip is the probe microscope.